right, so uh, thank you all for being here and for taking the time out of uh, your busy weekends to uh, hear some of my thoughts today. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Roblard, and the title of this talk is called Don't Go to College, How to Take Back American Higher Education. Uh, so some admin notes, uh, just importantly, this is a NC-17 talk, so some of the language and the concepts uh, that we'll be covering are a necessary evil, so if you have uh, children, or if somebody comes in late uh, with children, pl please bring that to their attention. Uh, please all hold all questions to the end, and please refrain from filming or taking any photos to the end as well. Uh, this should run about 50 minutes, and then we can have a nice Q&A at, at the end. Uh, so, as far as the outline, I, I want to cover a bit of a bio about myself and, and what prompted me to, to write this book, Don't Go to College. Uh, I want to give some evidence as to how it is that present-day American college and academia is seriously messed up. Uh, then I want to give some reasons as to how it has become that way. Then I want to talk about where this is all heading and why this impacts all of you and all of us, uh, independent of whether or not you've been to college, whether or not you have a kid going to college, whether or not you even care about what's going on at college, uh, because what is happening in the Ivory Tower affects us all as shared American citizens. Uh, and then lastly, I'll end with some prescriptions and solutions and a way forward for how we can take back uh, our colleges and we can take back our country. So a couple disclaimers. So the title of the book, Don't Go to College. Uh, a lot of people ask me, like, do you mean everybody shouldn't go to college? And our answer is no, obviously not. Uh, we live in a P.T. Barnum spectacle society, so you need to have something punchy that punches through the noise. Uh, sadly, that's the case here. That being said, when a building is on fire, even if 95% of the building is on fire, it's still important to say, hey, the building's on fire, everybody get out. And that is the case that we believe right now with the vast supermajority of American colleges and universities. Uh, so sadly, don't go to 95.5% of colleges do not fly with our uh, editors. And, uh, you know, this is the title that we ended up uh, running with. So that's the point of the title. As far as the subtitle, A Case for Revolution, what's that about? So to quote Barry Weiss, journalist and co-founder of the New University of Austin, she says, what has become obvious to anyone paying attention is that we are now living through a kind of revolution. It is not a physical one. It is not being fought within the physical limits of a battlefield. It is instead happening all around us and directly to us. It is redefining our culture, our media, and giving new shape to our public and private institutions. It is remaking the nations and the nation before our eyes. Likewise, George Orwell writer of 1984 on Animal Farm writes, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. So it is in this sense of revolution that we refer to our subtitle. And then lastly, what's with all the degrees? A lot of people will say, well, you know, you have, you have six advanced degrees between you and your co-author, Timothy Gordon. Uh, isn't this hypocrisy? And the, the answer is pretty simple. We, we don't think it is. Rather, it's merely a case in saying that we know whereof we speak. So consider us like two Hollywood actors that went to Hollywood, uh, ended up learning how corrupt it was, and now we're telling other would-be actors, look, there's no there there. It's not worth trading your soul for going there. Don't go. Uh, so in that same way, we're just saying, look, the water is poisoned, so don't drink. Not that we ourselves never drank. So a bit about me, I grew up here in Whitman. Uh, I'm a fourth generation kid from this, uh, this town. Uh, my great grandfather actually was a plumber that put in the pipes at the, uh, the Holy Ghost Church. And uh, my first memory uh, that I have uh, is that of my sister's baptism at the Holy Ghost uh, as well. Uh, I've had family members that have been members of the Legion and the VFW uh, throughout several generations. And uh, like a lot of uh, you folks, uh, my, my roots go back, you know, all the way to uh, the Adamses and to the, uh, the Mayflower. So I have a lot, of, uh, a lot of deep roots in this town and in this region of the country, as I'm sure it's the case with a lot of you folks uh, as well. 
So I ended up going to uh, Whitman Hanson, uh, the Whitman K-12 through uh, public education system, uh, wrestled for Whitman Hanson, graduated in 1998, went to uh, West Point uh, for my undergrad, ended up being commissioned in 2002, and uh, then went to Iraq in 2003-2004 with the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, it was there where, you know, my commitments to faith, family, and flag began to waver a bit. This was chipped at as well a bit by my philosophy undergrad degree as well. Uh, and then returning back to uh, homeland after deployments and then learning that the Bush administration's reason for going to Iraq at all uh, was specious at best and that the uh, Saddam Hussein's regime did not have <coughs> weapons of mass destruction. Uh, that really crippled my faith in our political leadership. Uh, so that effectively put me uh, soundly on the political left and I decided I wanted to get out of the military and pursue a degree in advanced, uh, advanced degree in philosophy and try to become a analytic uh, professional philosopher. So I got out in 2007 and went and did just that. I got my master's degree at the University of Victoria in British Columbia then I went to the University of Connecticut and got my PhD from there in 2016. I did some other grad work at uh, Oxford and at the Naval Academy. And then after I defended in 2016, I got a, a prestigious four-year postdoc at the University of Oxford. So this was my dream job. This is or was something I was looking forward to for 20 years of my life. And I finally achieved it. And I thought, uh, you know, it was uh, onward and upward from there. Uh, however, once I got to Oxford, I began realizing that there were some serious cracks in the, the Liberal Dam uh, that I had been unaware of during my graduate time. So, for instance, the, the woke backlash against uh, Trump and Brexit, uh, I did not anticipate. A lot of my colleagues uh, I found to be rather unhinged and, and rather uh, myopic in their view and not granting reciprocal uh, viewpoints to, to anybody to the right of them. Furthermore, people to the left of them, they never recognize as having any sort of uh, threat or having any unreasonableness to them. So that started beginning a, a bit of a crack in the liberal dam. Uh, in 2017, I started witnessing uh, folks like Jordan Peterson and um, uh, Brett Weinstein uh, begin to get drug over the coals. Uh, publicly for critiquing things like uh, critical race theory and transgenderism. Uh, so I thought that was also another canary in the coal mine, that things were not all well in academia. Uh, and then myself in 2018, early 2018, I decided uh, that I couldn't be complicit or silent in these ideas anymore. So uh, I decided that I was going to give a public talk on some of uh, the conceptual problems that were inherent in the transgender ideology. And uh, that's where I was told by a variety of my colleagues that I was not supposed to give this talk, that uh, we would require uh, physical security, that we would lose funding. And uh, it was at that moment uh, I, re I hit the edge of the video game and I realized that the entire time where I thought I was doing open-minded philosophy and open-minded critical thinking and open-minded inquiry, uh, it really turned out that there were, there were strict politically correct boundaries of what acceptable discourse constituted. Uh, I just never transgressed them. Uh, so once I did transgress that boundary, uh, I realized that really all of the critiques that had been offered by classical conservative uh, critiques of academia were correct. And uh, I suddenly found myself on the, on the outside of the, the complex that I had been in effectively my entire life. So that being said, uh, I hung around Oxford for maybe another year and uh, I just couldn't stand the, the blatant hypocrisy, the contradictions, the, the inconsistencies, uh, the, the craven careerism. Uh, so I decided to uh, get out in 2019 uh, I fortunately ended up with a, a, another postdoc that uh, got me to Notre Dame the following year, thinking that that would somehow be a bit better, uh, but it was just very much more of the same. You know, it was very much more progressive ideology, 
and uh, just with COVID masks. And, uh, you know, that really made me rethink that maybe all of academia uh, was, was deeply, deeply infected by this new woke ideology. So basically in 2021, after uh, I finished up that postdoc at Notre Dame, I decided I, I couldn't hack it anymore. And I wrote uh, an article on Substack entitled, How I Left Academia or How Academia Left Me, voicing uh, the many criticisms uh, of the contradictions and hypocrisies that I had witnessed uh, in academia. And this quickly garnered 20,000 views and uh, ended up getting me a uh, book contract with Regnery to write the book Don't Go to College and, and that was the, the genesis of the book was that essay. I ended up teaming up with Catholic philosopher uh, Timothy Gordon who had been uh, canceled by BLM and forced to, to be fired by his private uh, Catholic high school a year prior for critiquing BLM on Twitter. So uh, he and I both found ourselves on the outs of uh, proper academia and we teamed up and we wrote this book. So that's the genesis of how this book, Don't Go to College, ended up uh, being created. Now the thesis of the book is fairly simple and it's this, it's that there is something seriously wrong with American higher education. Put another way, America's colleges and universities are sick now, we aren't alone in this analysis. Uh, just recently, Charlie Kirk, the founder of uh, Turning Point USA, uh, just wrote a book called uh, The College Scam, which uh, became a quick bestseller, and it's effectively arguing the same thesis we are, that the college is, is now an, a costly and, and obsolescent project. Uh, Tucker Carlson and Matt Walsh of The Daily Wire have long critiqued the uh, the indoctrination or the, the left-wing ethos that is endemic to almost all colleges. Uh, Thomas Sowell at the Hoover Institute has pointed this out in his book Intellectuals. Uh, people like Ben Shapiro in his book Brainwashed have pointed this out probably about 10, over 10 years ago. Uh, most recently people like James Lindsay and Lindsay Shepard have also published books uh, along with Benjamin Boyce that have similarly critiqued the the woke orthodoxy that has crept into to nearly all Western academic uh, institutions of higher education. So meanwhile, outside of that political space, you, you've found people like Mike Rowe of Dirty Jobs, Dave Ramsey, Patrick Bett Davis, and entrepreneur Peter Thiel have also pointed out the costly obsolescence of present day academia. Within academia itself, people like Peter Bogosian have founded the uh, Alternative College at the University of Austin with uh, some of Elon Musk's funding, uh, along with Joe Rogan's funding as well. Uh, Jordan Peterson has recently founded Ralston College in South Carolina. And Jonathan Haid, the social psychologist at NYU, has founded the Heterodox Academy. Uh, so th these are all instances of uh, little islands of academic parallelism that are responding to the present woke hegemony within academia. In addition to this, so-called academic quitlet is now its own subgenre, as more and more people like myself are beginning to jump ship uh, as they're getting absolutely uh, intolerance of the, the woke uh, ideology that, that has crept into everything. And prior to, to this moment, there's of course been uh, clear predecessors uh, to, to this book. So David Horowitz's 100 Most Dangerous Professors uh, has pointed out these elements before. Uh, Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind in 1987 pointed out very much of these elements. And of course, William F. Buckley's God and Man at Yale, the superstitions of academic freedom, going all the way back to 1951, anticipated very much the same thesis that we're recapitulating here. So all these folks that we've just mentioned have essentially given a, a, a long established precedent that conservative voices have been calling attention for a long time to the dangers to America emanating from the so-called ivory tower. And while these folks have given their own set of arguments, reason, and evidence uh, critiquing American higher education, 
we offer our own unique set of arguments uh, in the book. And there are five major ones that I want to go over today. Basically, they include cost of college, inc incidents of campus craziness and campus violence, woke curriculum and, and woke scholarship, woke STEM, that is science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and lastly, the arrested development or opportunity cost of attending college. Now, firstly, with respect to cost, cost is probably the least philosophically interesting element of this, but it, at least it's on the, the moral ledger and the prudential ledger, so uh, we should at least pay attention to it. So according to the average cost of college tuition report for educationdata.org, quote, the average annual, annual cost of a four-year college is $35,000. Factoring for loan interest and opportunity cost, the ultimate cost of a bachelor's degree can exceed $400,000. Meanwhile, student loan debt is at $1.9 trillion, accruing at an average rate of $2,000 per second. Now, this, of course, has resulted in folks like AOC, Ayanna Presley, and the squad, as well as the Biden administration, coming up with the brilliant quick fix of uh, so-called student loan relief, which is effectively just getting other Americans to pick up the tab for other people's student loans, paying it forward to other generations as well. So this issue of the cost of college is symptomatic, we argue, of fundamentally a dysfunctional society, and it is one that is wholly unsustainable and something that we, as all Americans across the aisle, need to consider. As Mike Rowe of Dirty Jobs notes, quote, the cost of college has grown faster than the cost of energy, the cost of real estate, and the cost of health care, all of it. Somehow we got it in our heads that it is priceless. Well, guess what? It's not. So moving on, the second major reason we give as to why present-day American college is sick and uh, needs to be reconsidered is this sudden rash of no platforming, canceling, mob behavior and actual violence against conservative speakers that's occurred particularly in the last five years. Uh, in the book we cite over 70 campus examples and uh, while we can't and don't have the time here to, uh, to list all of them, I'd like to list a couple of highlights just so you can kind of get the, sh the shape of what we're talking about. So in spring of 2017 at Evergreen State College, professor of evolutionary biology Brett Weinstein was cornered by a crazed mob of shouting students calling him a racist for failing to leave campus during Evergreen's supposed day of absence, where all white students and faculty were strongly encouraged to leave campus for the entire day. Later that same day, gangs of students were, were reportedly roving the campus, brandishing baseball bats, looking for both for Brett and his wife, fellow professor, professor Heather Herring. Brett and Heather never returned to campus that day and would later win a $500,000 settlement against Evergreen after Evergreen took the side of the students over that of the Weinsteins. A year prior in 2016 at the University of Cape Town, a group of activist protesters known as the UCT Trans Collective stormed and disrupted a UCT art exhibit dedicated to the anti-colonialist Roads Must Fall initiative posing naked and smearing red paint all over both themselves and the anti-colonial artwork on, account, on account of the exhibit's excessively cis-white heteronormative nature and its failure to explicitly include supposed marginalized trans voices. In April of 2018, Eric Clanton, professor of ethics at Diablo State Community College in California, was recorded on camera clad in an all-black uniform and black ski mask, assaulting seven different people with a U-shaped bike lock, leaving one of his victims with a major laceration in his head, requiring five staples. In October of 2021, outraged students at Oberlin College took to social media to complain about feeling existentially threatened by the cis-heteronormative white male HVAC workers who entered their dormitories to repair their heaters. In 2019, at a Young America Foundation talk at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, conservative political commentator Michael Knowles and the uh, writer of the foreword for this book was assaulted by a group of trans students who threw a bottle of mystery liquid at his face and eyes during his highly controversial speech entitled Men Are Not Women. 
In July of 2021, the London School of Economics Gender Studies Department official website posted grad student Matt Thomas's claim that, quote, if TERFs, trans exclusionary radical feminists, think trans is, endemic, is an endemic threat to feminism, let us be that threat to feminism. Picture this, I hold a knife to your throat and spit my transness into your ear. Does that turn you on? Are you scared? I sure f hope so. In December of 2017, Drexel the Professor of Political Science, George Cicciarello, posted on Twitter, quote, all I want for Christmas is white genocide. And following suit in October of 2021, Professor of Women and Gender Studies and Africana Studies at Rutgers University, Brittany Cooper, celebrated the decline of white birth rates in America, calling white people, quote, villains, and stating that we need to take these motherfuckers out, end quote. So now, of course, with these captive audience students being made to ingest this neo-Marxist propaganda and ideology from such folks as Michel Foucault and his acolytes, who make such claims that all discourse is power and that speech can sometimes be violence or that silence can sometimes constitute actual violence, you can begin to see the justification or rationalization for such preemptive acts of violence and mob behavior. So that being said, what we are witnessing here with these, these acts of violence and, and mob behavior on campus is essentially the surface expression of a new hyperpotent form of Marxism known as wokeism. So sometimes known as otherwise as social justice or maybe identity politics within academia proper, wokeism is otherwise known as intersectionality. So intersectionality, first coined by feminist Marxist Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989, is a theory that conceives of certain persons and groups as being discriminated against, oppressed, or unjustly marginalized along an intersecting and overlapping set of axes, features, and criteria. So for example, a black woman who is disabled might be marginalized in part because of her race, in part because she is female, and in part because of her disability. And while there may be no law or social rule explicitly calling to uh, marginalize such specific persons or groups, the aggregation of these features nonetheless results in such person's severe marginalization. To become woke, therefore, is for a person, group, or institution to become consciously aware of how they have been constituting or contributing to or unjustly benefiting from these invisible systems of intersectional oppression. Now, popular expressions of intersectionality often take the form of the language of inclusivity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, critical race theory, various versions of feminism, anti-colonialism, and the omnipresent LGBTQ plus flag, where both the T and the plus are conceptual placeholders for a possible infinite set of marginalized groups. This is to include the uh, newly emergent marginalized groups, to include uh, minor attracted persons. What is also potentially in the queue are issues uh, or marginalized groups of bestiality, polyamory, incest, and necrophilia. The more marginalized and obscure, the better. In fact, yesterday, Microsoft just released a new ad showing a 40 gender rainbow flag. Uh, but then once again, why stop at 40? Remember, the plus in the LGBTQ plus is literally infinite. There is no logical stopping point to it. So that said, this ethos, essentially that of weaponized grievance and weaponized victimhood, is antithetical to any and all notions of American citizenship or personhood, for that matter. Put another way, this is the new Marxism and it's taking the old communist strategy of divide and conquer and taking it to a new iteration or a new version. Indeed, this anti-American, anti-Christian, anti-Western civilization ethos of intersectionality constitutes the very ecosystem that present-day students and faculty swim in at university. And it is simply taken for granted as a background condition of social life, as ubiquitous as oxygen, gravity, and high-speed internet. As the old saying goes, the last thing the fish sees is the water, and wokeism, or intersectionality, is the water of present-day academia. Now, some of you might be saying to yourselves, well, 
that's okay because I'm going to be sending little, little Johnny to college so that he can major in STEM. So science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. And while the humanities and the social sciences might be infected by this ideology of, of wokeism, uh, STEM fields are, by their very nature, immune to such ideological subversion. That, however, uh, is, couldn't be further from the case. So historically speaking, whether we look at the tyrannies of Nazi Germany or Maoist China or Soviet Russia, uh, historically it just has been the case that the objective science, so to speak, has become politicized in the past and has become handmaiden to the uh, political ideology of the time. Uh, secondly, if we investigate an increasing number of STEM fields uh, and, and STEM programs within the U.S. Uh, and within the Western-speaking world, we can find instances of this ideology of wokeism uh, beginning to take over and subvert the, sub, sub, the supposed objective science. So, for instance, a, a recent National Review article argues or points out that at several American universities, professors have declared that a priori mathematics the supposed universal language is, quote, a harbor for whiteness and, quote, dominated by whiteness and racism. At a recent American Philosophy Association conference, my, my former major and discipline, uh, supposedly dedicated to logic, reason, uh, dispassionate argument, and argu arguing from first principles, uh, there was a choose-your-own-pronoun sticker dispenser where everybody, students and faculty, uh, alike were highly encouraged to, to wear such stickers. Uh, within our prior logic, famous logician Greg Restall at the University of Melbourne has stated on his personal website, quote, there's much more to be done, especially on decolonizing our curriculum. So here he is making the argument that our prior logic is handmade or downstream from colonialism, of course, while making a logical argument but never mind that. Within biomedical science now, you find very few professors who have taken a Hippocratic oath towards health and towards not doing harm, failing to challenge the most basic claim now that men can get pregnant. And within big, te big tech, as evidenced by the sacking of James Damore at Google for his questioning of Google's so-called ideological echo chamber, uh, in computer science, the story is very much the same. So the point here being is that STEM is not somehow immune to ideological subversion. And wokeism is creeping in there as well, and future American students of colleges should be well aware of, of this fact. Now, a final cost of college that we note in the book that is not given nearly enough attention, we think, is the opportunity cost of, ten of attending college. So since many present-day colleges immerse students in an ecosystem of rampant sexual vice, aberrant sociosexual indoctrination, anti-family sentiment, and glorification of urban careerism, the side effect for most graduates is essentially a four to six year interruption during their most fruitful reproductive years, followed by a set of ideological and logistical commitments, making the possibility of establishing a family of their own first delayed and then tragically often forgone altogether. In fact, thousands of loving high school couples break up every year simply on account of this unquestioned narrative that they must go to college. My co-author, in fact, having been a former teacher at a, a prestigious private Catholic school, uh, he noticed horrifyingly several years ago that none of the students had any serious relationships. There were no serious couples. And he, he eventually got around to asking this, you know, why, why aren't students couples? Why aren't they dating anymore? And essentially, the response that they gave was, why bother? You know, we're just going to break up anyways when we, we both have to go off to our respective colleges. Uh, so the students, they, they weren't even trying uh, to have meaningful um, pair-bonded relationships because of this assumption that they must go out, off to college, otherwise their life is going to, to be ruined. So this is yet another unsaid major side effect of the you-must-go-to-college narrative that is the delay or prevention of future families. And if we regard the family to be the basic cell and basic building block of society, 
then the arrested development of family formation generated by attending most colleges and universities today really constitutes nothing less than the death knell of future American society as well as that of Western civilization. So why are things this way? You know, why is it that American universities have this nest or this network of, of various bad practices and bad ideas and, and, and a bad climate? Uh, it looks like the opposite of anti-education. It, it, it looks like uh, anti-education, anti-knowledge, anti-virtue. Like, why is it that our universities have become this way? Uh, and in the book, we give two major explanations. So the first explanation, the first thesis, you can call, let's call this the, uh, the Jordan Peterson thesis, or maybe the James Lindsay thesis. And this is the argument that, you know, whether it be Antonio Gramsci or members of the Frankfurt School, you know, Peterson's view is the, the so-called cultural Marxists, saw that Marx's prediction original prediction of the proletariat overthrowing the bourgeoisie never occurred. So frustrated by the failing of the Marxist prediction, uh, these folks refit Marxism into being no longer a battle between uh, the workers and the capitalists, but rather between oppressor and oppressed. And to quote Gramsci, they went about a long march through the institutions in a variety of incrementalist steps. Uh, particularly focusing on the institution of higher education. Uh, then we see traction or translation of this idea of, of a long march and subversion of the institutions uh, with Saul Alinsky in the 1960s in his book uh, Rules for Radicals and various iterations of such uh, neo-Marxist subversion uh, through various uh, programs through civil rights to feminism to the sexual revolution to the gay rights to LGBT to LGBTQ plus uh, where we presently are. So that is the Jordan Peterson cultural Marxist theory. Right? So it locates the uh, changing of the mission of higher education from that of passing on perennial knowledge and perennial wisdom uh, in order to make people responsible, knowledgeable, capable, virtuous citizens, and it refits education into a uh, project of perpetual revolution, perpetual egalitarianism, and perpetual norm destruction. So that is the uh, Peterson thesis. Our thesis, being both Roman Catholics and both Aristotomists, actually locates the crack in the, the dam uh, much further back. And our thesis essentially is that it was the removal of Aristotle uh, and final causality, uh, or otherwise known as telos, from the Western worldview uh, that has really created the downstream effects that bring us to the, the present state of academia. So here's a bit of a you know, quick, quick overview of what we mean by, by Aristotle and, and final causality. So final causality, or telos, is just the idea that the things that we encounter in the world have an essential nature, and they are essentially goal-oriented or purposefully oriented towards a particular end, uh, resulting in their natural, or directed towards their natural flourishing. So for instance, the telos of a functioning heart is to, to pump blood. The telos of an acorn is to grow and flourish into an oak tree and the telos of a um, human being. You know, a man is to uh, actualize the potential for fatherhood, that of a woman is to actualize the potential for motherhood realized in the family, and the telos of the family in aggregate is to blossom into a flourishing society and a flourishing civilization. This idea, of course, finds further articulation in the Catholic intellectual tradition in the form of natural law as articulated by St. Thomas Aquinas. Now all this of course gets chucked out the window when we hit the Enlightenment and man is reconceived of as either a, a Lockean tabula rasa or blank slate, you know, having no essential nature and having no telos or final end, uh, or worse, man is reconceived of as just a, uh, a pure mechanism, right? We're just a pure meat machine 
with no agency, no free will, no soul, no, no, no nature at all. So even worse. Uh, and that is essentially the anthropology of man that we have inherited uh, that is now uh, affecting the uh, present university culture. So as Aquinas once noted, paraphrasing from Aristotle, a small error in the beginning is sometimes a great one at the end. And that's essentially what we are witnessing here at America's universities. Essentially, one error compounding over an accumulation of errors over several hundred years, now resulting in a, a total rejection of telos, a total rejection of man having any essential nature at all. So you can see how that begins a small, small crack in the dam, and now that gets us to something like transgenderism, where people can speak their own, their own nature in and out of existence at will, and everybody else must obey what that, what that claim is. So I think that is essentially what explains a lot of how it is where we're seeing pre present day uh, campus craziness. In other words, get the anthropology of humankind wrong, what people actually are, and then everything else downstream from that error is going to follow. So one might ask, well, you know, where's this all heading? And if there's one point that I could emphasize for you all to take home today, it's the following. It's that what happens in the ivory tower does not stay in the ivory tower. In fact, what is happening on campuses is going to and has it has affected all of our shared cultural institutions. The, the rainbow campus safe space is extending well beyond that of just the college campus and is permeating all of our other shared institutions. And a lot of people think, well, once these students get out of the, once these snowflakes get out of these safe spaces and they show up at their first job, then their boss is going to whip them in, into shape. But that is hardly the case at all. Uh, as we see now with the, the advent of, of so-called woke capital, it turns out that the boss and the free market aren't just some magical corrective. Rather, the, the rainbow safe space is bleeding out into all of our institutions, to include the free market as well. Now secondly, a second point that I want to emphasize is this, is that there's no such thing as left enough and there's no such thing as woke enough. As I noted before, the plus in LGBT plus is literally infinite. So this ethos of intersectionality, it's like an expanding gas that there is no container for. So without something that is going to contain it, it's going to keep expanding. And there's going to, by necessity, be more and more marginalized groups that are spoken into existence and then begin agitating for uh, their own particular rights claims. And we've seen versions of this, of course, before uh, in the political correctness and the control of language in other instances of prior instances of communism, whether it's Mao's China or Soviet Russia or other countries that have been overtaken in the past by communist, communist ideology. They all demonstrate this exact these very same signs. So the point being is that there isn't a pendulum swing that's going to happen. Leftism isn't a static set of beliefs. It is a one-way ratchet. Furthermore, it's no coincidence that this increasingly strict policing of language and therefore policing of thought found in the majority of college campuses in this country often falls in lockstep with glorification of hypersexualization and one world government. Since the nuclear family is the single cell of the nation and the greatest bulwark against state tyranny, sexual liberation and sexual indoctrination that impede family formation is arguably the greatest form of political control. That said, the LGBT rainbow flag is therefore not a symbol of love and tolerance and unity and diversity but the flag of globalism, of one world government, and the effective erasure of faith, family, and nation. Indeed, to quote Polish priest Father Marek Jadrowski, quote, not Marxist Bolshevik, but born of the same spirit, neo-Marxist, not red, but rainbow. 
That is what is being taught at the majority of U.S. college campuses. Now, I know what I've presented here to you today is rather dismal, and it's a very pessimistic and bleak look at the present state and fate of American higher education, but I don't want to leave you thinking that everything here is lost. Far from it. Indeed, there are, very, there are several very real and concrete actions that we can all take to take back American higher education and to begin to take back our country as well out of this, this present nosedive that we are presently finding it in. Uh, and in the book, we offer five major points or, or actions that we can all use to take back American higher education. So number one, most importantly, and this obviously is the crux of the book, is to starve the beast. Boycott college, boycott the present college industrial complex, drain the academic swamp. Starve it of students, of funding, and of social legitimacy. As philosopher John Searle once noted in his work, The Construction of Social Reality, social objects like currency, banks, and governments tend to operate and behave in the total opposite fashion as do physical objects like buildings, clothing, and automobiles. The more times I use a physical object like a garment, the weaker it gets. The more times I use a social object like a dollar bill, the stronger it gets. Accordingly, social objects and social institutions, such as woke colleges and universities, become stronger every time we participate in them, use them, and grant them further social legitimacy. If you want to weaken them, and stop feeding them with your funding, your children, and your social respect. Second point is we argue to make a stand internal to the woke beast. Now, this is not going to apply to everybody, uh, but it will and could apply to a, a very small set uh, of brave and courageous students, professors, and uh, administrators that are within a academia proper. So we argue that conservative professors and conservative students, and especially conservative professors if they are tenured, that they make an active effort to, to push back publicly and to, to fight to take up space and, and to defend the turf uh, that they can within uh, academia proper. Thirdly, we argue that we need to rebuild, revive, and attend only classical Western Civ programs. So in the book we offer uh, a, a set of what we argue for an approved set of colleges. So we point to the, the Cardinal Newman list, these are all Christian Aristotelian schools, uh, Hillsdale College, uh, Stonehill uh, is on there, as well as some of the service academies and some other colleges. So as you can see, we're, we're boycotting the, the woke colleges, we're running offensive disruption operations internal to the, to the beast, and then we're building and reinforcing uh, the classic Western Aristotelian model of higher education. Fourth, we argue is, and this is the Mike Rowe, Peter Thiel argument essentially, is that in addition to going to uh, classical programs, we need to get back to the trades, we need to get back to local entrepreneurship, and we need to get back to big families. So the argument here is that not everybody needs to go to college to live a flourishing life, and uh, it, it, is, it behooves a lot of people to go ahead, get into the trades, learn local entrepreneurship, and not waste their time getting uh, useless woke degrees. Uh, the culture war is going to be fought with big families, not um, more letters at the end of everybody's name. And then lastly, and probably most difficult, but probably the most important, is to speak up and tell the truth or at the very least stop tolerating lies. Now, this is perhaps the hardest act of all, perhaps the most essential, as it is likely one of the only acts that will ultimately save us from the less ceaseless direction of travel and control of language and of thought. What's more, if history has anything to say about it, it is likely wishful thinking for one to think that staying silent and complicit in lies will somehow save oneself, certainly not in the end. Seeking protection under the dragon's wing just means you get eaten later rather than sooner, but just as a coward. That said, speaking up now rather than later, 
really, really boils down to a question of prudence more than that of courage. And who knows what might happen if one can muster such courage to speak. Indeed, to quote Alexander Solzhenitsyn in his famous essay, Live Not by Lies, if we do not paste together the dead bones and scales of ideology, if we did not sew together rotting rags, we would be astonished how quickly the lies would be rendered helpless and would subside. That which should be naked would then really appear naked before the whole world. So in other words, speak up, speak the truth, and stop being silent and complicit in obvious lies and obvious falsehoods. And if we all do this, individually and collectively, then maybe, just maybe, we can take back our colleges, our culture, and our country. Thank you.